Oh, Bontoro, I, my God, I didn't think I'd feel sorry for you in this show, but I do now. Hey guys, it's your girl Aisha, aka Geek XX Chic, and we are back with another reaction to Shogun. We're now on to episode eight, which is called The Abyss of Life. That is such a happy sounding title. <laughs> They've just been getting warmer and fuzzier every single time. Anyhow, the last episode was tense. We basically had poor Toranaga with his back to the wall. His brother, who we thought was supposed to be lending him aid, actually turned out to be a turncoat. He had taken a regency, he'd taken the regency seat that was open, and he is now working with the other regents to get his brother to go to Osaka and accept his impeachment, which of course will result in his swift execution. And basically, they've surrounded this seaside village and what's left of Toranaga's forces and said that if he didn't agree to this, that basically it was gonna end badly. They would have to go to battle right there and then. And looking at the size of the forces that his brother had versus himself, Tornaga knew that that was probably not gonna be an advantageous war. We see that his son is very eager to learn more about his dad, but also very upset that his dad's not doing what he expects him to do in this situation. And of course, this is a ripple effect, of course, to Yabashige, to Omi, also to John, because John obviously does not want to end up at the brunt with the losing side of a battle. But anyhow, after a lot of deliberation, Toranaga decides to surrender and it's not met with very happy responses. We see that Yabashige and his son are very upset and John calls him out for being a liar. But then we see we ended the episode with something that's pretty tragic. Toranaga's son, who, as I mentioned, has been really working hard to impress his dad, to make his mark, to do anything to change the situation. He goes after his uncle while his uncle is, um, shall we say, otherwise occupied. And he chases after him and he has the drop on his uncle, but a moment's hesitation and a bad, what would you say, a, a misstep, quite literally, ends with him slipping on a rock and literally cracking his head open. And that's it for him. Unfortunately, his son has died and things are just not going well. So I have no idea where we're gonna go in this episode. Lots of questions. Hopefully we'll get some answers. So let's jump into the episode. Just before I do though, a reminder that if you'd like to be notified of when I do uploads of this show or anything else you might be watching of mine, you can go ahead and hit that subscribe button and hit that notification bell so you'll be in the know. All right, that out of the way, let's get into the episode right now. Well, it looks peaceful for now. It's good, right? Right? You know, Yabashige, if you meet your end, I'm not going to be sad. Saikisama's army will camp at Edo's boundary where they will wait for Toranaga-sama to mourn his son. How long? Three days? The customary 49 oh, days. Oh, wow, damn, okay. That's a good time. A month's a good amount of time to, you know, ponder your death. Well done. It's not a lot that can be said during a time like that, you know? You know people mean well, but there's just nothing that alleviates the grief. Fine strategy, yes. At least Nagakado-sama died fighting. Did he? You must be eager to be reunited. Not so much, so much actually. What becomes of her? Don't go to Osaka. It's her choice. My allegiance forbids me from doing anything else. What to do now, John? You finally got what you wanted. Your way out, your way home with your men. The easy answer is to take your boat and get the hell out, but comes down to how good that, uh, that good good was with Mariko. How good was the good good? I'm kidding. I know it's deeper than that. <laughs> I knew it was her idea. I knew it. Didn't I say? There's no way that Ishido had that kind of brilliance. She's not wrong about that. Mm -hmm. That's why. That's why. Mm -hmm. She got you. She leading you by that poom poom and you haven't had it yet. The way I don't care about this love story or wannabe love story. Mm hmm. There it is. I don't think she wants to be married to Nenny Oliver again. 
I don't know. Is there a benefit to her marrying him? At this point, I don't think there is because she's using him as a pawn. She doesn't respect him either. Not that she really cares, I guess, about that at this point. I feel like she just wants to be single. Please don't pretend you actually cared about this kid. Poor kid. That is a hell of a legacy to live under. Mm-hmm. That he was, unfortunately. Uh, I wouldn't go that far. He was a kid. He would have. Approval is all that he was seeking in the end. Excuse me, sir. You you and your uncle were trying to slide up under Ishido. Okay. That was his belief, but yeah, sir, you're not the one to give that speech. Not when you and your uncle are looking for the first opportunity to go and turn on Tornaga. Please, please spare me the false the false righteousness. And do what? But I mean, I guess in fairness, they do have the right to go out fighting if that's what they want, but... Hmm, you personally. Yeah, he still got a little something, something for you, bro. You're not escaping this. That's why you should have picked a side and stuck with it. Interesting. Also did not know that they burned the bodies back then. I know certain cultures burned, but I, I wasn't sure about Asian cultures. But no, now that I think about it, quite a few of them prefer cremation over burial. What's going on with you, Toranaga? Are you plotting or you just can't bring yourself to be there? I don't trust it. Ah, oh, that's your... Okay. Interesting. Hmm. Are we enduring? Or are we just hating? Hmm. I would really love to see the chess game between all these women, personally. Thanks. Ooh, no eye contact. She said, get out! I'm trying to kill my man, my side piece. You trying to court me now, sir? Okay. Trying to court me after you beat me senseless? Okay. He does not want. That's not what he's asking for. Yeah, he's learning. You thought he was a dummy, didn't you? I must say I am in Oh, why did you thought it was dumb? You have made your own way out here. Except I seem to find Catholics in every sordid corner of this country. Like the Kakarooch. Wow. Now he has cut you loose. It's really none of your business. My crew. And then he tells him. Aboard my vessel. You didn't have to tell him that. Thank you, Father. Like, really, you shouldn't be trying to stunt on anybody with that haircut, sir. <laughs> I feel like he's putting on this illness. The, co the cough sounds a bit fake. What do you want? Quickly! AKA, we just care about our churches. We're still building those, right? Right? You've wasted my time. Period. Mm. You may not. Ochibanokata has manipulated Ishida out of hatred for you, and I see no cause for her anger. Mm, he's not lying about that part, but I still don't trust him. He already knows this, though. If you form an alliance with his mother, the heir would be free to turn against Ishido. I don't think Ojiban is open to an alliance at all. At all. That's why he asked, bro. Yeah, but Ojiban... Is it? Although, this might have been Ochiba's plan the entire time because that actually works to her favor because that's the most powerful lord and the smartest one. <laughs> right? 
Do you think she's gonna let it go? Cause I'm... What? Start talking, sis. Possibly. I still don't trust her, though. I was about to say, I, that's, the, that's the venom I'm getting from her. Ooh. Ooh. Teeth? He's right. I was right. Yep, didn't I say the options he was thinking of would be too much sacrifice? But you just, sir. Bro, but forcing them to? You should give them the option to fight or at least try to avoid death. Happy. Bye. I'm sure you guys heard everything because you were eavesdropping right outside the door. Because you sent the vessel away. Yeah. Mm. That sounded a little too wrapped up in a bow for me too, sir. I was like, mm-hmm. So go and tell him that I'm weak and sick and beggarly and that I don't plan to fight. <laughs> I see you, Tornaga. Mm. The knees you need to be Asian, I just could not. I'm not built like that. Not y'all reciting haikus to each other. Matcha! This all seems very formal. Aren't, isn't, like, I know, I think in Japan, isn't there a tea ceremony that you do when you're, like, courting or you're going to date as well? I mean, I don't think that's what's happening here since they're already married, but maybe. Because uh, I've noticed that um, Bantaro has definitely changed his tone. Seems to be trying to approach a little bit more gentleness versus fury. It's too late, but still. Yeah, I saw this on the Karate Kid. <laughs> Sorry, it's the first time I did see this, this, this tea ceremony. I remember the spinning of the bowl, but they were on a date, so I don't know. Well, now it's awkward. Who's we? Is we in the room with us? It's called love, hun. <laughs> you can say it. Excuse me? We still have a kid. Where is that kid? Wow, you're that salty about her falling in love with someone else. Really, you wouldn't grant it to me when I wanted it, but now. Mm, yeah, no, this isn't for me. You're not doing this for Mariko at all. Right? Selfish. Mm-hmm. Exactly. Ooh. Period! How dare you try to romanticize what you want by taking what my grief. Oh, you've got a nerve, Bentaro. Thank you for the tea. Miserable. If you loved her, if you were trying to do a gesture for her, you would let her go. Tell her you're divorced because it's over and you know it's over. Yeah, cry. I can't believe he thought a cup of tea was going to be enough. <laughs> They've been living it up. Right? It's like they're kind of loud. They're a little rowdy. And take that energy straight back to Europe. <laughs> Here's John probably thinking they've been suffering this whole time. They've just been getting drunk. This thing's like building skates at low tide. Ah, see what happens when you start washing? It makes a difference, right? Come back. Come back. Look at him, he's embarrassed. I love this. It's showing that John's changed. He doesn't realize it, but he has. He's adapted, they haven't. It's giving you up for a tag. That's a long story. I have a few friends, good crew we could train. I've been training some of them on the cannon. To do what? They're not going to be on the boat with them. Where does the pilot want to take us this time? Maybe Africa or back to the Americas? No, please just stick, go back to Europe. First Englishman to the strait, ready to make his name. I mean, does it 
matter at this point? Should we just get out? But you come to realize that we are here. What is left of us is because of you. A little bit. First, take off those skirts. We'll, um, we'll careen her. We'll scrape her. The extra men we need, you leave that. I said take them off! No. Keep being naked in the streets. Stay down. You're drunk. John? Whoa, John? 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 That is not about him. That's about you. Yeah, I don't think any good conversation is going to happen while none of them are sober. Mm-hmm. You got decisions to make, John. Yeah. Why, why would he go to Yabashige? And I wish to forge allegiances benefiting this country economically and strategically. Hmm. You wish to sail on Yabashige Sama's behalf? I don't wish it. He is a shit face. <laughs> he is a brave shit face, and that is the truth, so I must ask. He's not lying. Uh, no, he knows that he's a snake. Is it? PC is straight through Yabashige, please. He's like, I know a snake when I when I see one, because, you know, same. I'm free of any obligations to him. He's made that very clear. If he were in my position, he would do the same. Possibly. Perhaps there existed a, a moment in which I had fooled myself into believing that I could one day belong. This place, but that's Look at you having an identity time. crisis after being with one of your old crew. But I do know that now I'm left to whittle what fate I can for myself. True. I've known you were a man who understood the importance of taking fate into his own hands. I'll give you a shige that. He's still so proud of that moment when he almost drowned out of stubbornness. <laughs> Always like, uh, do you two need a minute? <laughs> Listen, you weren't there. Oh, he's going to talk to you later. At least not publicly. You see, once loyalty begins, it does not have an end. Otherwise, it would not be loyalty. It's kind of the point, exactly. That's what the definition the of loyalty means. Turns senseless very quickly when the order is suicide. Would you like me to translate that? Or was it for me? Right? I see through you, sir. If you got something to say, these two always be arguing in front of other people. And you wonder why they already, they're already onto the two of you. Nice. Not yet. That's why you have no vision. Oh, she's crying. I really hope it happens for her. Ah, uh, and her planning. Shut up. I mean, it's a good question to ask. If you don't really feel loyal to the cause, then it is, right? Like, loyalty, true loyalty, you should feel ready to go for this cause. That's okay, good. Figure out what you do want to fight for. I do agree. Like, blind loyalty when you don't actually believe in the cause, to me, is worthless loyalty. <laughs> Not the church next to the whorehouse! <laughs> <laughs> oh, Tornado, I love you so much. <laughs> Welcome to Japan. Please, sir, as if you and your other brethren are not going to be over there frequenting it every other day. Please get off the high horse. Oh, my God, I love Tornado so much. <laughs> Petty even in death. <laughs> oh, God. Is she okay? Who's this? Oh. Oh, that's the teacher. The little the heir's teacher. Did she do that? Because I know she did not like, she doesn't like her. She did this. We know since episode one, this lady does not like Ochiba. Or not Ochiba, but she didn't like Ochiba's plan. She'll do no such thing. Was it medicine or poison? Look what I made. Oh, just like that, huh? Hmm, medicine, my foot. Yeah, look at that. Couldn't even fake a tear. Hmm, I don't think that was a stroke at all. 
All right, well, that's her last possible issue inside of the uh, this house of Osaka. I love the symbolism of this half-built tower. <laughs> the look he's giving him, like, I hope you all know how to write. Don't do it unless you mean it. Mm, the pressure. It's a lot. He said I signed in shit. Wow, no one's believing that he's giving up. Here's the test. He doesn't want to bring the fight here. When you put it that way. Mm -hmm. Force the hand. I mean, he has the right to do so. Damn. Damn. Lay on that guilt first. Lay it on. He's like, I've been with you since you was 12 years old, boy. <laughs> History. Damn. Did you have to use that adjective? I mean, I don't think I would want to do that either, bro. But I, I definitely couldn't gut myself. I don't know what's... I don't know. I don't know, guys. I don't know. Goodbye, old friend. Damn. Okay. Toronaga said, I call your bluff. Oh, his eyes are unreadable here. I mean, his son just had a pointless death. Damn. Da oh, shit. Okay, damn, Toronaga. But I mean, it is his decision to make. Petulant as ever. No, oh, Bentoro, maybe you want to look away for this, bro. You gotta do what you gotta do, bro. Not your son. Why would you do that? I know it's tradition, but I could never put my kid through that. You can't make a challenge like that unless you plan to follow through. Yeah, Bentaro doesn't really feel like he's got much to live for at this point. His wife don't want to die with him. You do have a kid, though. Oh, he's like, I'm giving you one final lesson so you understand exactly what your wife's been trying to tell you. Oh, yes. He is layering on that guilt before he goes. Damn, he's a professional. I can't. Why would you choose your son to do that? That's so horrible. Peace out, bro. My God, that takes... But I don't blame him. I wasn't going to let those guys in, in Osaka do that to me. <gasps> oh, Bontoro. I, my God, I didn't think I'd feel sorry for you in this show, but I do now. And now all your men. What does that mean for them, Toronaga? Was that worth it? I don't even know. I don't know what to say. I don't know whose side I'm on with this. I don't know. Damn. Damn, Toronaga. Damn, sir. She liked her father-in-law. At least not out loud. <laughs> the way he knows that man better than he knows himself. Oh, he's trying to push everyone away. Hmm. 
Back to the hawk and all analogy. Mm-hmm. He knew. That's what that last look meant. Damn. I knew that look was so unreadable, but... God, I hope so. Period. She is, mm-hmm, resolved. This chick scares the crap out of me. Look at her face. Zero emotion in there. She can accept the marriage proposal now. Look at him. He's practically salivating. Sir, please. Decorum. Look at him. <laughs> Weirdo. It's so cute that you guys really think that Toranaga is dumb after all this time. <laughs> Yabushiki is so unintentionally funny. I can't. Mm -hmm. We know. I don't trust that smile, but if there's one thing about Yabushige, he is absolutely self serving. Oh no. Oh! Things just got spicy! Oh! The up and down! She's ticked at you, John! She ticked at you. They're definitely gonna have anger sex later. Damn, just have people waiting to open up the doors to your bedroom? Where do you find that? Mm. His son. Wow. Wow. Mm. God, I hope not. I really hope not. Oh, thank God that's the end. That was a lot, guys. <laughs> that was a heavy episode. That was a lot. The emotion, like I've said it before and I'll say it again, this show, its ability to build tension without a lot of action is amazing. And that's just a great testament to the writing, the acting, the way it's directed, the way it's shot, like especially that last part was really tense. That whole situation with the meeting with all of his frontline men, that was very heavy. Like not necessarily, like I was anxious, but not like scared anxious. It was more of like the heaviness of what it meant for this to happen. And I have to give the call the kudos to Hiro for how he acted that when he was looking at him. The Like I said, that unreadable expression when he's looking and giving that last look to uh, Hiramatsu. Uh, and it's just, it was like, I knew there was more than what was going on. The silent conversation was, was clear and loud and yet it wasn't the most discernible. Like it was just really good face acting, but we'll get to that because that was kind of the biggest part of the episode. What else did we have in here? Some of the highlights we see the son's funeral, they're on their way to Edo because his son's dying, which I don't think, I mean, obviously that was an accident, but oh my God, blowing my mind that, and I had a feeling it would possibly go this way, that Tornaga just looked at his son's death and realized it gave him an opportunity. Like the level of calculation this man has is both amazing, but also frightening. And I, I, I'm i gonna get into that a little bit more about why, you know, how that is and how it could be perceived. But anyway, he's on this march to Edo and the coughing, you know, he's clutching himself. He's holding his body in a way that makes him look older, that makes him look sickly, weak and in grief. And I don't think it was fully an act as far as the grieving, but I absolutely picked up immediately that the cough was fake. Like, <laughs> you know, like it just, it didn't sound like a real cough. And again, you know, I know he's an actor and he really wasn't sick, but still, you know what I mean? Like I, you can just tell when someone's kind of putting on a cough. But anyways, I picked up pretty quickly that he was trying to make sure everyone around saw him looking as though his health, like everything's declining for him right now, right? Everything, his health is declining. He just lost his son, so he's grieving. He's not in his right mind. He's just had to sign over um, and admit defeat. He's going back to, to bury his son. He's he's written his will. He's giving everything away. Like he's making the, he's making sure that the facade, the, the charade is complete and that first step is him going to Edo. And, you know, we see that John comes up and 
tries to offer condolences and he doesn't really say anything. He just walks away. And I think that there that was twofold. One is because I've said this, and I do think that to an extent, Tornago absolutely is sad that his son died like this. I don't think he ever wanted his son to go like this, but also because I think it felt a bit hollow in that moment. Like if you've ever lost someone close to you, you know that as much as people are mean the, the best when they're expressing their condolences, especially right after, it just feels a bit hollow. You know, it just feels like the words are never enough. <laughs> you know, like it, again, like, you know, they mean well, but it just, nothing is gonna soothe that grief, at least not in the, in the immediate. But I think there was some of that, but also I think that Tornaga figured out a while ago that he and John think fairly similarly. So I think he was a bit, maybe a little worried that if he spoke a bit too much to John or interacted with him a little too much, that John would figure out that there was subterfuge at play. Because we saw the speech John gave last episode where he was like, you're a master trickster. Like this doesn't seem right. So Toranaga, he needs for this ruse to be pulled off. He needs a lot of his own people to believe it, right? Like, and that's true. Like the best, the best subterfuge you can pull off. Like if you really want to pull off a true scam, you need to get almost everybody, including people who know you well to believe it because that's the only way other people are going to believe it, right? And so this is what Toranaga's goal is. And at this point, he can't have John, who, bless his heart, is not the greatest that's hiding his emotions. He can't have John knowing all that. So he kind of just shoves John off. And then from that point, we find out that he's got just shy of two months of a mourning period because his son has passed away. And so thankfully his brother gave him that. They didn't think anything of that. Again, his son's death was not anticipated, but as he put in the end of the episode, it gave him a window that he would have never, he wouldn't have had otherwise. So they get to go back to Edo, which gives him time to put things in place and to think and actually be in a place where he's got more control of the landscape and the situation versus Osaka. And we see that he gives John his freedom, right? He says, here, John, here's what you wanted. You wanted your boat, it's back. Here's your manifest and you can take your men and leave. Like, here's your, I'm giving you your exit. Like, this is what you've been asking for. Here's your chance, take it and go, right? And John, of course, when he gets it, you can see that it's, it's a masterful stroke to give it to John here because he knows that while John wants this, John doesn't really want it, right? If John really wanted to go that bad, he probably would have been coming back and doing a heck of a lot more to put pressure on Toranaga. He would have done more things to try to leave, but... Tornaga has seen that over time, John has assimilated that he has been, especially in the last few episodes, making that effort to assimilate and to integrate into the culture. But I think more than that, Tornaga recognizes that John has an emotional connection to this place now in the form of Mariko. And he's seen that, especially last episode, he sees just how deep that connection goes. So I think Toranaga was banking. All of this, of course, is bets because of course Toranaga doesn't know these people entirely, but he can predict behavior to a degree. And he's like, if I give John his freedom now, now when he's not expecting it, now when there are stakes, now when he knows that if he leaves, there's a very good chance that the one thing that he cares about in this area Medico might end up dying with me. He's not going to go. He's not going to want to go. Not like that. He's not going to be okay with it because he's not the John of you know, the first, the, was it second episode that came before me telling me every, all, all these things, right? This is a different John that I have before me. Now that John is gone. This John has stakes. He's got investment. He's been sitting here training my men, building bonds with the people, learning the language, dressing like us, talking to us. And as I said, falling in love with us. So that John, this John that I have now that has done all those things, is he going to really just pick up, turn tail, grab his men and leave? Is he gonna be able to do that? You know, pretty sure that John was not gonna be able to leave, especially because of the way Tornaga gave it to him, right? John is not a coward either, right? John doesn't back down from challenges. So the way Tornaga gave him this exit as well, it kind of almost makes John look like a coward, right? Like he's running away. And that's something that wouldn't sit well with John either. So masterful stroke on Tornaga for giving him his walking papers like this. And knowing that John was going to explore it, however, right? Because John like thought that's what he wanted, right? All this time he's been begging Toranaga for this ship and these papers and to get his men. And he's like, yeah, go take it. Here it is. And we see that John actually does do that, right? He goes, he finally goes to find his man that he's not seen. And I don't know, they haven't given us timelines, but I think it's been a few months now. And he has no idea what they're up to, what kind of condition they're in. But you know, in his mind, he's thinking that they're still the men that are in the pit that he left all those months ago, right? That they're being so hard done by that they're going to be desperate to get out at all costs. But lo and behold, he discovers that not only are they fine, but they've been basically allowed to live in their own little portion of Edo. They can get drunk every night. They're allowed to have courtesans. Like they're basically living the life of Riley with the exception of the fact that they're actually not in their own home, right? So you can see that in of itself 
kind of shocks John to find that out. But it also lets him know that things are very different. Like what's been going on with him and what's been going on with them are so very different that maybe it's changed the objective that they were all at back in episode one. And then we see that, uh, sorry, I forgot to mention just before that, we see that John has that conversation with the priest. I can't think of his name, Suji was it? And Suji is basically like, you know, shocked that John has adapted as much as he has in the short time that he's there. We see that he tries to like translate for John and John's like, excuse me, I know exactly what I was saying. I understand Japanese somewhat now. Thank you. And you know, the shock on Suji's face because he just thought that John was going to remain ignorant. But John was basically like, no, 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 I've made my own way. And we hear Suji even say that like, wow, you have made your way despite everything. And you can see he's actually mildly impressed. But of course, John's prejudice <laughs> kind of comes through and he's like, don't be impressed, leave me alone. And then Suji basically is like, okay, so if you're going to get your men and leave, he's like, are you going to go dress like that? And of course, Suji knows that from their perspective, they're going to realize that John is not the same person, right? Because even if you look at Suji, he's learned the language, yes, but he still wears his priest's robe, right? He's still wearing the hair that he would hair, wear back in Portugal. And the same thing goes for all the other Catholic priests that we've seen. They've all maintained their westernization despite being in Japan. The only thing that they've changed is that they can speak the language. But you see even the food that we saw them eating when they were in that, um, that's one thing that I, I remember, the food they were eating when they were in their quarters was all westernized food, right? It wasn't Japanese food. So it shows the mindset of them. They're still separate, even though they're there in this country and they're learning the language and, and learning how the culture works. They're not trying to adapt or assimilate. And they're very much keeping a separation between the West and them. Whereas John has blurred those lines and he's trying to assimilate, fit in and actually, you know, be one of these people. And again, not exact, he knows he's never going to be one of them, but you know what I'm saying? He's trying to integrate into the culture versus, you know, be uh, outside of the culture. And so anyways, this kind of dovetails into when John finally goes to pick up the men and he, I think the, the way they did this was brilliant is when he starts to walk down to where they've been staying and he stops immediately because the smell hits him. We already know that from John's watching through John that there's certain habits that they have that the Japanese don't like they don't bathe regularly they bathe you know periodically John has now gotten to the habit of bathing regularly because he's been around people who bathe regularly so right away he's going to notice now he's like the Japanese and now he recognizes why they kept asking him if he was going to bathe and so you see like just even that I just love how they did that it was subtle but it was so powerful in that he immediately starts to notice that this is different and then we see that one of his crewmen comes out and the way he's acting, he's loud, he's slovenly, he's drunk, he is just, he's just being, you know, I mean, the way he's always been, he was the way John was not that long ago, but this is where John is starting to see now that he's not the same anymore. He's understanding now why the Japanese guy told him we'd be happy for them to leave because like, we can't handle it. Like we're not, we're not impressed. And now John, like the John of episode one would have been like, what's wrong? He's just drunk. He's just having a good time. Now this John is like, oh God, you're embarrassing me, right? <laughs> you can see it. He's like, damn, this is the way we look to them. I'm starting to understand now why they, they act the way they act. So I really like how they show that John has changed so much. And in that moment, John started to recognize somewhat that he's changed. Not fully yet though, but he can sense that this kinship he would have, he, that he felt with them back in episode one is no longer there. And then of course that man comes up. We see John actually tries to leave. He tries to he just avoid the situation entirely, but then he gets called back. They have the conversation and these men are like, we don't want to go back on a ship with you, John, because we don't trust you. Like you brought us here. It turns out John, I didn't realize that John had lied to them after the, the captain died. But they're basically like, we can't trust that if we go on a boat with you, you're actually going to take us home. Like, are you, are you sure you're not going to go on another, you know, another crusade? You're not going to pull us someplace else? And we know that, you know, John has his little book of all the different Spanish bases that he wants to hit anyway. So understandably, the men are like, we're a little weary of you, John. What guarantee do we have that you actually want to take us back home? And John basically is like, look, whatever, like, let's just go. We'll figure it out on the boat. And then he's saying like, they don't have enough crew, right? Because there's only six of them left, including John. That's not enough to run a ship as big as the one he has. So he's saying we can bring some of these crewmen that he's been training up. And you see right away his crewmen, um, the other guy says like, we're not going on a boat with these guys, right? Again, that mentality, just like the, the, the Catholics, that's them, this is us. We don't mix that, right? It's, it's us and there's them. Whereas John, he doesn't have that differentiation anymore, right? And so this is what it kind of hits John that, okay, this is not gonna work out. And 
he just tries to like bypass it and be like, look, we gotta leave. We're basically been told we have to leave, let's go. And we see that the soldier says to him, not until you take that dress or those skirts off, right? So once again, he's like, I don't like this, John. You're looking like them. You're one of us. When you look like us, you can be with us. First of all, we already know John Amon got them clothes anymore. They burned them, right? Long ago, because they stank. But either way, John at this point really doesn't, you can tell he doesn't want to be associated with these guys anymore, not as they are because he's changed. But he doesn't realize that in the moment and it's a bit confusing for him and I get it because he knows he's not part of the Japanese, but at the same time, now he feels this distance between the people that are supposed to be his people. So we see that he ends up getting into a fist fight and beating the crap out of that guy, but that was not about him. That was definitely John's frustration being taken out. And we see that he just ends up leaving them because he realizes now, like I said, that there's a difference. John's got a bit of an identity crisis there and recognizes that, you know what? I can't, like, I can't just t take these guys, go back on a boat and just leave at this point. The other thing is that John came all this way and sacrificed a lot because he want, he had an objective. He wanted to set up trade. He wanted to push the Spanish out of there, or sorry, to push the Portuguese out of there. So he's kind of feeling like, okay, that's my new mission then, right? If I can't just go home, I can't just go back to my old life, then let me go to Yamashige. Somebody that I know does not want to die. Like there's one thing John figured out about Yamashige is that he's not the kind of man that is easily going to let his life be taken by someone else, right? And so he goes to him and says, look, let me sail for you. Like, let us go and do what Tornog is not willing to. I can, I'll, I'll helm the boat. You bring your men. Let's do this. And Yabashige, of course, is like, no, I'm not gonna do that. What? That's gonna make me look unloyal, right? Disloyal, I can't do that. And I, of course, I knew that in the back of his head, Yabashige's like, yes, please, God, yes, please, right? <laughs> cause he don't wanna die, right? He's always trying to save his skin, but of course, cause Omi's there. And obviously this is Toranaga's house. So he knows that there's ears. So of course he's like, no, no, I would never, disloyalty. Oh, boo. especially also with, with Medico right there, who's Toranaga's right hand. So he of course, didn't, you know, denies the offer at least at first, but also he's thinking, what's that gonna get me? Like there's no advantage at this point. And like he said, truthfully, He's like, I think Toronaga's got a plan. Like he's definitely got some kind of plan. Like this is the Toronaga that snuck out of, of Osaka in a dress. There's no way he's just gonna let us go and die in Osaka, right? So, so he's kind of in that mindset. And of course that kind of leaves John in another precarious position. He's in limbo because like I said, he knows he doesn't wanna die, at least not at the hands of Ishido or any of the people in Osaka, but he also, doesn't really want to go home yet, right? He doesn't want to leave. Because even even if he did have his crew, I don't think John would have left because it makes everything that he went through up until this point kind of meaningless. So he's having a really interesting moment right now. And I think that we'll explore more of that probably into next episode when he starts getting into the plan that's being executed and seeing Mariko in, in action, which I'm very much looking forward to. But let's go, that kind of dovetails into Mariko. Mariko, this episode, we see that um, she... I didn't realize that Ochiba's sister is married to one of Toranaga's sons. That's what I'm picking up, right? I might be wrong about that. Y'all can please correct me if I'm wrong. But from what Medica was saying to that girl, she just gave birth to Toranaga's grandson. And we know that the son that passed away was not married yet. So it couldn't have been him. So that means Toranaga has yet another son. Maybe we've seen him, maybe we haven't. I don't know. Or maybe he's no longer with us. I don't know. Anyway, that's another, that's a grandchild. So that's one of Toranaga's kids. And she just had that. And also she is Ochiba's sister. So Toranaga is all wrapped up in this family. Oh, that's right. Because that's in the beginning, episode one. That's right. He said that Lady Ochiba came to Edo to visit her, that girl that we're seeing. So anyways, we see that Mariko is trying to get information out of the sister saying like, have you heard anything from Ochiba? Like, did she tell you anything about what's going on? And her sister basically is like, no, she just gave a formal letter saying that my family and my kid wouldn't be harmed with this surrender so that we're good. So she's like, that's pretty much it. I don't know anything else. And she kind of asks Mariko, like, what do you think is going on there? I'm like, what do you think is going on with my sister? Because obviously she probably has heard that people have been talking about Ochiba. And we hear Mariko say astutely that she's like, all of us have our own way of fighting in this war. And she's like, your sister's way is staying hidden. Right, so, and that's so true, right? Right now, Ochiba is very much hiding behind Ishido and the regents to make her plays, but stay out of direct fire, which is smart. And that's the best way she can play it, especially being a woman back in that time, right? So that kind of brings us back to 
uh, when, um, who is, what conversation was, it was Toronaga. Is it Toronaga? Yeah, when Toronaga is, is talking with the priest. Um, actually, we'll, we, yeah, we'll just dovetail into that really quickly, actually, because with the Mariko Ochiba understanding how women, women think situation, we see that, um, Suji, after he sees John, he goes and sees Toronaga and he's, basically trying to see if the deal around that they made back on the ship around, if they helped Toronaga, he would let them build churches in Edo. He knows that things are going bad, but he's trying to test the waters to see whether or not they'll still, you know, Toronaga will continue to honor the deal. And Toronaga, uh, when you're there and having this conversation, basically Suji says, we are aware, like us, the Catholic priests are aware that Ishido is working with Ochiba. And like Ochiba is the one who's doing all this. It's not because the rest of the regents are down for this. Like he's like, I don't want you to think that we're all against you. This is all, you know, Ochiba's doing. And then he says, you know what? I think if you make a deal with Ochiba, if you try to align with her, then this changes because then they the, the other regions will probably fall in line with you if you if, if her in the air work with you and then Ishida's left standing alone. And we hear Tornaga say, like, I don't know if that's gonna happen. Then he's like, I think Ochiba hates me. And then he looks to Medico and he's like, You guys were friends once. What he's like, what chance in a million is there that she would ever align with me? And I really like that Meriko, the line she says there is that Ochiba, you're not Ochiba's enemy, fear is. And that's a really great way to look at it because we saw this a couple of episodes ago when Toranaga and Meriko were talking about the reasons why people fight. And she was saying that women fight for different reasons than men. This is kind of coming up again when Mariko's saying like, Toranaga's looking at this from a male strategy, you know, strategic standpoint, from a power standpoint. And of course, him being a man who actually can access said power, he's going to look at this war much differently than a woman who's inside of it, who has very little agency outside of what she's able to manipulate from inside her cage, so to speak. And so I like that Mariko kind of frames it as, I don't think it's really about you, Toranaga. It's about, she's looking at the fact that if there's, you know, her son is still very young, and he is the only thing that's really the tie to keeping her alive. The reason he's alive right now is because the Regency was put in place, but the Regency's looking to shift. They've been looking to shift for a minute. If that happens, they're coming for my son. And I know that. So how do I protect myself and how do I protect my son? So she's looking at whatever I have to do, right? Toranaga is the most powerful regent within all the regions, right? That's been known for a while. And so her targeting Toranaga, we're thinking from what we've seen, it looks like Ochiba might be looking for some revenge for her father, but it's possible that she was just playing a long game Uno Reverso and thinking, if I target Toranaga, put him into a position where he has no choice but to align with me, then I get his undying loyalty. I get his unwavering loyalty to me and my son sworn to me, no worries, no back doors, and then I can take care of the other regents. But I need to put him in a position where that deal is advantageous to me and not to him. Maybe, I don't know. I don't know if Ochoa's got that level of long game, but the fact that she came up with, and I was right about that, didn't I say it was her idea to bring in Toranaga's brother as the regent? She's, she's a thinker. I think she's much more like Toranaga thinking wise than not. So it's possible she's playing a long game like that. And I never considered it until Medico brought that up. I don't know though. But like I said, that's one thing about Ochoa. She's a great, I don't even know if I want to call her a villain at this point, but she's a great antagonist to our main character here, Toranaga, because I, she's so hard to read. She's so hard to read. <laughs> I really have such a hard time kind of figuring out her truest of intentions, which is good. And that's when she's like Toranaga like that. But either way, so kind of coming back to Mariko after all of that, she's kind of got that insight about what's going on with Ochiba, her own mindset around it. And I do think she has a, a better understanding of the deeper motivations of Ochiba than anyone else, but I don't think she necessarily understands what's going on up here. That's what Mariko is kind of dealing with in the beginning. And then we see that all of a sudden Bontaro is all sweet and nice. All of a sudden he's looking at her with soft eyes. All of a sudden he's like, oh baby, can we have some tea? Let's spend some time together. And of course, Medical's like, yeah, sure, whatever you want, bro. Like, we, every other, you wanted to behead me yesterday, but sure, yeah, let's have some tea today, whatever. Just whatever keeps the drama to a minimum. And they have this tea ceremony situation. Like I said, I know my reference for, my deep references on Japan. Sorry, that tea ceremony that I saw in the episode, it reminded me of what I saw in Karate Kid Part 2 ages ago. There was like a tea ceremony that happened between the lead character and a Japanese character. And again, I know it's the Karate Kid, which is far from the most accurate representation of Japan, but I saw a lot of similarities to that ceremony and that one that was in the movie. So I was like, okay, in the Karate Kid movie, it was like a romance thing. 
And I'm like, I'm not sure if that's always the case or if that was actually the case, but it feels like that's what it was. And we see something like that happen between Bontoro and Mariko. And it's very clear that he's trying to woo her at this point, which as I said in the episode, too little too late, sir. Like you forget that you, you literally put hands on her not that long ago. And now you think that a cup of matcha is gonna fix it? Like, really, sir? I mean, it did look like he made it mas masterfully, but still. Anyhow, he uh, has the tea and he's saying that, you know, he's reminiscing because he's like, yeah, this is a dark time. You know, if we're about to surrender, that means we only got a little bit of time before we gotta go. And, you know, I want to reminisce about the good times. And then we hear him say, like, you know, in the beginning we were happy. And she's like, I don't really remember any of that. It's all a bu it's all just a blur. To which I'm thinking she wasn't happy at all. We saw that in the flashback a couple episodes ago. America was not happy to be married off at all. I mean, I feel like she was probably less bitter towards him, but I don't think she's ever been warm or affectionate to him, if that makes sense. But anyhow... He basically says, hey, you know what? Uh, since things are good right now, let's let's basically commit seppuku together. He's like, let's go together. We'll we'll die romantically. I give you your I'll, I'll grant you your wish. You've been asking me to let you go all these years, and I'm gonna give it to you here and now. And this guy had the audacity to be looking at her and smiling while saying this. Like, and I'm just like, bro, no, this is not for her. How dare you turn this very personal very real thing of getting, you know, the the revenge that she wanted of, of making peace with what happened to her family, taking that and twisting it because you are jealous of, because what did he say before, just before he, uh, he said that? Oh, has, have you, have you, um, have you broken free of the Anjin spell yet? Right? First of all, reducing your feelings to a spell, like to some girlish crush, that's condescending, rude, and also none of his business. And two, then saying, okay, well, let's both take ourselves out because I'd rather you die with me then possibly find happiness with him, right? Like just Bontoro, bro, I get that he's frustrated. I get that it sucks for him that his wife never loved him the way that he wanted her to. But this is just like, bro, if you're really about to die, if you really cared about her, if you really wanted to have your, I'm trying to get into heaven moment, you should have told her, I'll let you go. I'll break up with you because we're, this is done. This is clearly done. Let me, you go do what you want to do. You be happy for the first time. You do what you want to do for the first time in your life, please. But no, talk about let's both take each other out. So I love that she said, boy, you missed the point. Once again, you missed the point of what I was asking you. It had nothing to do with you. It was about me making a decision about my own life. Me getting far enough away from you that you couldn't control me anymore. That is what I wanted. And you still sitting here trying to control how I go out of this world. And I love that she got petty and said, sir, frankly, I would rather live a thousand years of misery than die with you today. Forget it. Thank you for the tea. Bye. Right? Like, oh, Montoro, he kills me. So yeah, he sat there and cried as he should because I'm tired. Like, hopefully he's finally gotten the message and will back up off of her now. But anyways, Marika at least says, let that, I'm glad she got that cleared up. Let him know, like, this is dead between us. It's dead. It's never, it, it's been dead. And then we see that um, everything happens in the, in the end of the episode. And then it comes back to at the end when she figures out what's going on, that the whole thing between, oh, between my man, uh, Toranaga, and the late Mr. Haramatsu was all a ruse. Like this was something that they had to do in order to make the ruse seem real. And of course she's gagged, but also I think a little bit impressed, but also sad. But either way, we see that she gets asked by Toranaga if she's ready to finally play her part that he's been promising her for a while. And she's ready now. Like I feel like she's more resolved than ever to make this happen. Not just because she knows that it's a losing battle otherwise, but just between what her husband pulled and John trying to cut and run, like she's just like, I am ready to show some people what it is to stand on business. So send me in, put me in coach. Let me finally do things for myself. And so I'm excited to see what Mariko is gonna be up to in the next episode. Cause like I said, she looked resolved as hell. And listen, she's been, I know she's been holding back. We know there's some stuff to come. So that was Mariko, very cool in this episode. She's now set on her mission, which is great. And then finally, we can talk about this ruse that's going on with Toranaga and the rest of his men and what he's trying to make sure gets out there for this, whatever his plan is here to go up against the Regency. And we heard from uh, very well put by Lady Ochaba that she said that, because remember we see that uh, Ashida's feeling all confident. He's like, oh yeah, what you planned was great. Oh, Toranaga getting defeated in his own village is perfect. Oh my gosh. And she's like, boy, calm down. She's like, if Toranaga, until Toranaga's literally got his face on the ground with our foot on his neck, he is still a threat. Like he's still, as long as he's still breathing and has capacity to move and breathe, we cannot breathe yet. 
right? So I'm like, this is why I said, Ochiba, you need to watch out for. She sees Toronaga in a way that pretty much nobody else does. But anyhow, we see that Toronaga has taken this time. Unfortunately, the unexpected death of his son provided him with a window of opportunity that again, he couldn't have planned for. I do think that Toronaga thought his son wasn't gonna make it. Um, I will say this much. I think that he, based on the prediction of his son's behavior, I think he knew his son would do something impetuous. I think he knew that his son, either way, if his son even made it to Osaka, he probably wasn't gonna live long. But I don't think he thought of all things, like I said, you can't plan slipping on a rock. <laughs> You can't plan for that. However, I think Toronaga always expected that his son was going to do something crazy. I do think it's possible Toronaga anticipated that his son was going to try to attack his uncle and that he wouldn't survive it. And that either way, if his son died, it would give him time to do what he needed to do. And that sucks. But without sound, oh gosh, I'm sounding as cold as Toronaga now. If his, I don't think his son was going to be someone who was going to be an asset to him, at least in the short term. I think it was a peaceful time and things were chill. He could have let his son live out his life and be whatever he wanted to be. But in this particular case, in the place they're in, in the brink of a war, he can't have he, he can't have impetuous, rash-minded people doing crazy stuff. He don't have time for that. So unfortunately, in the giant chess game that Toronaga is playing, I believe his son then became a pawn. As soon as he realized his son kicked off this war before he was supposed to, inevitably in his mind, Toronaga's son became a pawn. And that sounds cold and horrible, but Toronaga to me is at that level. When you are a warlord at 12, you've learned to make some hard ass decisions. That's the sad reality. But anyway, so I think that's what happened is that in Tornaga's mind, his son was a pawn and he decided at that point that his son had only so many moves he'd be able to make. But all of those moves ended in him not surviving this, I think is what Tornaga at least planned for. And when his son passed, like I said, the ruse of looking like he's falling ill, going into Edo, knowing that he would have that two, well, 49 day period, he needed to get some things in motion. But of course, with a plan of this magnitude, he cannot let a lot of people know. He can't let anyone know. Why? Because they're not, they're gonna let it show, right? Even his soldiers that were wearing their armor to his to the son's funeral and showing their defiance. Toronaga knew that if that's the way they're acting, he couldn't give them an even small inkling of a whiff of a hint that he was gonna have a backup plan because it would, of course, flow all the way back to Ishido and Ochiba, his real issue. And then it would cause more problems. He's like, I need the ruse to be complete. So at the end of the episode, we see all the different pieces that he put into place for that. The grieving of his son, the talking about the senseless death, the giving, you know, giving away all the things in his will, giving the land to the courtesan, giving the land to the priest. <laughs> the land that he put right now, my God, I'm sorry. We got to just touch on Toronaga putting the brothel next to the church. I'm sorry, that is some petty sh I love it. I love that. I love him for that. Toronaga, I love you. But anyway, <clears throat> bringing it back. Giving away all the land and then having the funeral, not going to the funeral, keeping himself detached from that, acting like he's too, too sick, too beaten down, too emotionally distraught to even be out there. Clearly he was plotting in peace. And then of course, having his men get demoralized. He needed his men to actually give up. He needed his men to feel like it's over so that everyone feels this. So everyone in, inside of his, his army, inside of Edo, and then of course, undoubtedly, there's definitely spies and ears in Edo that are reporting back to Ishido. They're all gonna hear the same message, which is that, holy crap, Toronaga really gave up. Toronaga really is giving up, he's walking away. And in all of this, I think initially, there was never a plan to take out Hiramatsu, but when he saw that the way that they acted at the funeral, that some of his men were refusing to take off their armor, that everyone, even Yabashige is like, nah, like there's no way he doesn't have a backup plan. That's when Toronaga's like, I need, I need something that's going to be enough of a, what's the word? Like I need a chess move that's so hard, that's so big, that even the people who think they know me are gonna think, holy crap, he really has cracked. What can I do? My son's already gone. What other big move can happen? And I mean, I think he had that conversation with Haramatsu. And he's like, you need to give our men a reason to think that I've given up. We need to break their suspicion of me. And it's gotta be something convincing. We can't do anything short of something dramatic. And I don't know if it was, yeah, but I don't know if it was Toranaga who suggested it or if it was, if it was Hiramatsu, but either way, they came to the conclusion that Hiramatsu had to go. And honestly, that level of dedication to the cause, that level of loyalty, 
That's why I said in the episode, you know, when Omi was having his identity crisis, this whole episode saying, I don't know if this loyalty is worth it. And that was a question that was kind of the theme throughout the, the episode is what, how much loyalty is too much loyalty or is it real loyalty? You know, and Omi questioning whether or not he should even be fighting here. And I said it in the episode and I'll say it here. Loyalty only matters if you believe in what you're being loyal about. Being loyal in words only, does, if it doesn't reach your heart, that's not true loyalty. You will turn at some point or you'll regret it, one or the other. And if Omi's not down for the cause, then he shouldn't be. He should leave or he should do whatever he needs to do to walk away. But we see that Hiramatsu was that dedicated. He was that loyal and he believed in the cause enough and believed in Tornaga enough that he was willing to literally commit seppuku for a ruse. For a ruse. And they did it. Like they they put on the play. The play was masterful. And like I said, I, I will love forever that look between Toranaga and Hiramatsu that really, you know, it, it, in, in the moment, it looked like Hiramatsu was begging him not to, not to do this. But now I'm looking at it, now that I know the full scope, I feel like it was them saying goodbye. It was a wordless goodbye between their eyes, two friends, hiramatsu has been with him since he was a child. That's a lifelong friend. Saying goodbye to him in that moment, knowing what he was about to do. I bet you Toranaga was probably back and forth in his head too. Like, is there any other way around this? And there just wasn't. Ah, and like I said, I even felt bad for Bantoro in that moment, moment having to be the one and him telling, you know, even him, you know, Hiramatsu telling Bantoro, no, you can't die. You need to live on. You need to make this worth it. You need to you know, go with this cause that's going to be stirred up from what I'm about to do. And yeah, he goes. And thankfully, Bantura was able to do it in one one hit, not 19. But still, damn, that was rough. Like, it, it, it really, like, that touched my heart, honestly. The loyalty of it touched my heart. It was senseless and sad, and I hate it. But the loyalty of the move itself was actually beautiful. And yeah, that hit Tornaga. You could tell that hurt. That hurt. That was a hell of, like, that was probably, and I hate to say it, I think that that hurt him more than his <laughs> I really think that that hit him a lot harder than losing his son. But anyway, so that happens and that, you see it, it, sh it sends the shockwave through his men and everyone, even Medico, thinks, geez, this guy actually has given up. It's really over. It's gonna end like this. And so that happens. And later on, we see that him and Medico have that conversation and he lets Medico know. I, first of all, I love that he's like, so did John go and talk to Yabashige yet or what? <laughs> I love the fact that he he's just he sees all these people. But yeah, then he lets Medico know yet again, like he did way back in episode one, that this was all part of a plan and that he like he basically kind of half apologizes, like, I'm sorry that I had to keep you out of it, but you I needed you to believe it too, so that when I sent off uh Yabashige and I sent off the priest and all the people to go off to Osaka, everyone's gonna know and feel like I've broken, like that's it. It had to be real. And so Basically, he lets her know about what happened and the way he breaks down, even talk, trying to talk about Hiramatsu, that's how you know it just, it really hurt him. That was a, that was a real loss, but this is going to fire him up though. Like he is no, more determined than ever to win this battle. Like there's going to be blood in Osaka. Know that there is going to be blood. I don't think Ishido is surviving this. If he does, that would be sad, but he is definitely going to pay for that. That blood that was spilt on the floor in Toranaga's room there, it's, it's going to be paid back. 10 times over, but anyhow, so I thought that was great. And then that last scene where Toranaga goes to the ashes where not only his son, but now his best friend have both been burned. And he says, thank you to both of them. He's like, thank you for your sacrifices because you gave me an opening that I wouldn't have had otherwise. And I'm not gonna let it go to waste. I'm, I'm definitely gonna make the most of it. So I am looking forward to seeing how this whole thing wraps up because Toranaga is absolutely a, he's an artist of battle strategy. It's it's a very gory, terrible, dark, painful painting, but it's still a masterpiece. And I'm so looking forward to seeing how it's all gonna come together. We have two more episodes, I believe. So I think it's gonna be nothing but going uphill ramping. Like we had two pretty quiet episodes action wise in these last two. I don't think we're gonna be getting that for the last two. So I am very much looking forward to it. And again, just enjoying the storytelling, enjoying, my gosh, the acting. Like I said, Hiro, Mr. Imara, this, this, this episode, you absolutely killed it. The facial acting, the subtleties, you did it. You did the damn thing. And I do hope that you're gonna get some awards for this because you deserve it. So yeah, great episode, guys. I talked a lot, but I feel like you just had, there was a lot, even though it was quiet, it was layered as usual. I enjoyed it a lot. I hope you guys stuck around this long and through this whole thing with me. If you did, I appreciate you. Thank you. If you did like it, please do show some love to this video and I will see you in the next one.